what we're facing is like a level of, of street homelessness that we've never seen. We started with just under 50 people experiencing homelessness back in 2018, uh, unsheltered homelessness, to now we're well over 400 people. We have a housing supply issue. We do not have enough housing spaces for all who need it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the liberty of using the word emergency because I believe that the homeless crisis in London has risen to the level of an emergency. When you walk into a place, if you're labeled as homeless, if someone looks at you and they've identified you as homeless because of your clothes or your uh, demeanor or crap over your smell or whatever, whatever it is that they identify you, if they identify you as being homeless or having mental health, they immediately devalue you in their, in their mind. And they immediately take you down and look at, what do I do to deal with this issue? It becomes an issue. You, you hear the analogy, death by a thousand cuts. Commodification of housing is a huge issue, right? Um, rental rates going through the roof, uh, people's incomes not um, um, aligning with that, so poverty-related issues. Uh, those are really a perfect storm, I think, of things coming together that are uh, really impacting the people that are most marginalized. To understand homelessness at, at its root is to understand the human <laughs> having the experience. My brother experienced homelessness as a teenager. My brother looks like me, sounds like me, uh, was smarter than me in school, um, and he became homeless. And through that time, he was still a person. He was still just my brother. He was his buddy's buddy. He was human, uh, and he was no different than you and I. And that's the same for each and every single person on the street. We still have this idea that if an individual is uh, homeless, that it's their fault. They have a story. They have usually a series of unfortunate events, uh, which is really kind of, I think, what separates any of us from crisis. With some of the youth that we've encountered, like their parents stigmatize the, their children having mental health. And that's why the, the kids end up out on the street, because their, their parents didn't like that they were sick. The vast majority of youth who become homeless have not used a substance other than perhaps, you know, casual alcohol or marijuana use prior to their experience of homelessness. The reality is also that most people who use, um, you know, drugs and alcohol in a problematic way are housed. Most people who have uh, struggles with their mental health issues are housed, you know, and so why are we not allowing that opportunity for people who are experiencing homelessness to have that same foundation? There was an attempt on the part of the City of London to um, remove people from the um, central um, locations, the, the central parks. People have been banned from having encampments in this area and they've been pushed out to the periphery. So we actually saw a reduction in homelessness from 2008 to 2018. That switched before the pandemic. We ran into a wall. We ran out of capacity of affordable units. We, we have a lot of large landlords in London now who, who are being directed by um, corporate uh, real estate investment trusts, and we call that the financialization of the housing market. 
well, they're pricing people out and they're doing it consciously because they're looking at real estate. They're looking at the real estate investment, not, not as a social good. That's an actually a fundamental human right that people have, have to have, but they're looking at it as uh, yet, yet, another, yet, yet another moment to uh, expand capital. Uh, so we have all these combined pressures. We have newcomers, we have the Toronto bubble, we have more students coming in. Um, and we also have a homelessness system that's rapidly rehousing people. Uh, and so we use up all of our housing. What that does is it makes the price skyrocket. And then bam, we hit a wall of expensive housing, not enough supports, and we start to go the other way. The pandemic basically ignites further a fire that was already started. The reality is the decisions made by federal and provincial governments absolutely have an on-the-ground effect. Our provincial government cut the affordable housing funding by $250 million a year uh, several years back, and that means that new affordable housing developments are not happening, which creates and influences that backlog in the system. We have a housing supply issue. We do not have enough housing spaces for all who need it. It doesn't help us if we create a whole bunch of you know, $1.2 million homes in the city. What we need is rental units, what we need is affordable units, we need high density units in our downtown core. We need to actually grow in a way that is fiscally and financially responsible for the city. I believe that the city could be doing much more proactively. When we look at having uh, governments who, who remove things like rent controls, um, or don't strengthen those kinds of pieces and rents are allowed to escalate to a point that they're inaccessible for, for everyone. Um, and social assistance can't even get you the cheapest apartment that you can find. Um, that's a problem. You know, when people receive Ontario Works, they get $400 for rent a month. Um, we can't find rooms for people for that amount. There's not one additional cent that comes from higher levels of government if you declare a state of emergency on this issue. Um, what we are doing is recognizing that this is an emergency and acting appropriately. For me, uh, I'm much more focused on acting in ways that recognize the emergency that this is than making token motions or token declarations that don't actually cause us to change the direction or the intensity that we're addressing the problem with. The system is broken, so how do we reimagine that from the ground up? It's been described multiple times as, you know, building a bridge as you walk across it. So it is not a polished, complete document that solves all of the challenges. It is a new approach to how we build pathways and a system that is centered around both housing and people. It's one thing to put somebody into housing. It's another thing to, to stabilize them in housing and be really intentional with the work that we're doing. What it does is it starts to center services around hubs low barrier 24-7 access uh, to spaces where you can be warm, you can get food, you can get a shower, you can do laundry, uh, and if you choose to do so, access a variety of co-located services. One of the biggest reasons people re-experience homelessness is that they don't have the proper resources available to them to, to know what to do next. Instead of building a program and telling people access this program, why don't we go and talk to people, ask what do you need, how would this best be suited, and then build a program around their needs. Flip the narrative, yeah. Someone once asked me, what was the best advice you could give someone going through this trouble? So I'm about third party, 
to help because you can't do it on your own. There's no way, like we try to do our own for two years and then someone pick us up and tells, hey, you're on our team now. That's some things we thought was in a month we had house out. You need to work together. You need to coordinate with other people. You need to have everyone working together. I think there's certainly a bit of a disconnect with the Western bubble and then the rest of London. In the Western bubble, all of the things that you could need are sort of within your fingertips um, in a little, a little tiny, cute little bubble. Uh, I urge people to, to burst that bubble, to get out into London. When you're here for four years and you're just like focused on school, I think it's really easy to get lost in the fact that like, oh, it's a university town, but it's really not. It is actually a city that has real problems. It's still our home for a period of time, and so trying to improve the community you live in, I think, is really important. Oh, I think students need to realize that this that they're not in a bubble. There's not an immunity to the challenges that our city faces just because you're attending a post-secondary institution. And it may not appear that, but there may be someone sitting beside you who's struggling and on the verge of not being able to have a home. And I want to say something to the frontline workers. They have been inspiring in the generation of this new political will, this new community collaboration. To have the motivation to continue to work in that space for all of the frustrations over all of the years of inaction is not only inspiring, but it's, it's heroic. We've marginalized people, we've pushed people to the margins, and that means that we have a responsibility to, to change that. In this great privilege I have to be able to do this work, it's a way to make an impact and a way to make change. I also think that, you know, it's a bit of a, a rebellion um, against the system that says the people we're supporting are not worthy, right? It is a bit of a, you know, fuck you. They, they are worthy and, and worth being treated with dignity and respect and compassion and worthy of all the supports we can we can find to offer to people. Everyone's worthy of a, a good and dignified life.